Good afternoon. Or, as I usually say when I open up my talks on Saturdays, Shabbat Shalom. I'm relieved I previewed that video before this panel, otherwise it would be very hard for me to start right now. I want to welcome you all to migration, aggravation, failing states, and flooding borders. I repeat this title only under protest. People don't flood, people flee. We have a global problem right now with the dehumanization of refugees, so I need to note that. Refugees are people who flee. They don't flood. And another correction, in spite of what your agenda may say, I am not Gideon Rose. <laughs> Gideon could not make it today, so Peter has asked me to step in as moderator. My name is Mark Hetfield. I'm the president and CEO of HIAS, which was founded in 1881 as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, intended to help Jews fleeing the pogroms of Russia and Eastern Europe. We like to say that Hyas used to help refugees because they were Jewish, but today we help refugees because we are Jewish. Now, while Hyas is actually the oldest refugee agency in the world, we were relatively obscure until October 27th, when just two hours before murdering 11 innocent people in a Jewish sanctuary, the terrorists who attacked the Tree of Life, Pittsburgh, Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh had posted on social media, Hyas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. Apparently this hateful murderer was obsessed with Hyas. This was an attack against Jews, but more specifically, it was a, an attack against Jews for helping refugees. So he managed to check two hate boxes. Hyas is one of nine U.S. refugee agencies that works in partnership with the U.S. State Department to resettle refugees in the United States. And we also work in a dozen countries around the world to help keep refugees safe where they are. We also work with hundreds of congregations, Jewish congregations across the United States, and with Jewish family service agencies to welcome refugees, including the Jewish Family and Community Services of Pittsburgh, and Congregation Dor Hadash of Pittsburgh, which was housed in the Tree of Life Synagogue, uh, which was celebrating a refugee Shabbat, working with Hyas just one week before the attack. Now on this panel, I'm honored to be joined by Mrs. Cindy McCain, Chair of the McCain Institute for International Leadership in the United States, Dr. Norbert Rotkin, Christian Democrat and Chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the Bundestag, U.S. Senator Tim Kaine, Democrat of Virginia, and Dr. Comfort Arrow, Africa Program Director of the International Crisis Group. There are over 68 million forcibly displaced persons in the world today. This is the highest number in human history. Over 28 million of these are refugees, meaning they have crossed an international border. Now, I'd like to open with, um, I'll ask two questions myself, and then I will throw it open to you, uh, the audience. Now, first, in yesterday's opening session, uh, the speakers did their best to assure us that in spite of rhetoric to the contrary from certain heads of state, having learned the lesson of two world wars, the United States and NATO countries' commitment to collective security is as strong as ever. Around the same time as NATO was formed, the United Nations developed a refugee convention and a refugee agency to ensure that never again would people be trapped inside of a genocide or inside of persecution, that refugees would finally have a right to flee, a right to seek and enjoy asylum. <clears throat> now I'd like to ask each of the panelists if they, if they can give us similar assurances today to the global commitment, about the global commitment of refugee protection. Is it as strong as it was 50, 60, 70 years ago? Do we have the leadership we need on this issue? Mrs. McCain? Well, I definitely think we have the leadership on this issue. And there's, there's so many good people around the globe that work tirelessly on this that maybe are not in leadership either, but are on the ground physically providing care. Um, we have a muddled political cycle right now. And 
The rhetoric has not helped. It has not helped the view of what a refugee is. It's now muddled with immigration. It's muddled with many other things, words and, and descriptions that are incorrect. So, and, and combine that with, with social media, and you have what I believe is a, is a recipe for disaster. Um, I do believe that, that the NATO countries have, have done a remarkable job uh, uh, helping this, this flow and being a part of the solution and not the problem. But uh, it's not just the European refugees that are coming through. We're still deal dealing with the Rohingya. We're still, still dealing in, in many ways with Central Africa um, and Somalia and a, a bunch of others I don't need to mention. So. Um, I like, when I talk about refugees, I like to remind everybody it's not just the Syrian or slash Syrian flow, which is not all Syrian. Um, it's more than that. So uh, I, I just, in my own opinion, I believe that we should address it wholly uh, as, a, as a, com you know, a complete group of refugees <coughs> and not just single them out. But I guess the short answer is I'm, I don't know. I don't think we're there. Thanks. Dr. Rotkin? My short, uh, my short answer uh, is no. We don't have a global commitment on refugee protection uh, because a, a commitment on protection is not a matter of words, but a matter of deeds. Uh, and what we have seen on the one side, of course, is that, that migration uh, has been a reality throughout the history of mankind. But on the other side, we have seen a modern revolution uh, uh, in the field of migration, because the wish of people to have a to have a safe and decent life has globalized, and there, and the wish has two so main sources. The one is the experience of war, of violent conflicts, and the other one is the experience of poverty. And so you have refugees, close to seven million. Uh, across the world, and we have around about 250 migrants who are seeking a better perspective for their lives. From the European perspective, the one source is located in the Middle East, and the other source of migration is located in Africa. And this is also a question of demography. We will see the doubling of the population of Africa within one generation, from 1.3 billion to 2.5 billion. We will have 700 million Africans in 2030 below the age of 18. So we have a young population. Uh, and what we have experienced, particularly in Europe, is that the higher the pace, I think this is a general formula, the higher the pace, the higher the numbers, and the more distant the culture uh, of migrants, uh, the, the, the bigger and stronger is the impact of migration on the stability of Western societies. So what we have seen is an experience of, of a real novelty. This is a spillover effect. Problems and people do not stay where the problems originate, but they come over to us. This is a new experience. So migration has has created a deep impact on the stability of our societies. I, I, would, I would dare to formulate a very far-reaching thesis that we have to learn as Westerners, because the West uh, uh, describes the countries of destination. Migration is not a matter for Russia, not a matter for China and others. So it's us because we have mass attraction, we have soft power. People want to live and want to share our, our values and standards of life. And my thesis is that we have to draw the conclusion from what we have experienced, that we can no longer separate the stability and security of our societies from the fates of the millions of desperates and the instability of the regions in the Middle East and in Africa. So we have really to adapt to something which is a fundamental challenge to the feeling of identity, the feelings of uh, that there is a loss of security, be it economic security, cultural identity, and there is a new competition. It's a global 
competition and the national competition, there is an easy answer. Shrink back from that. Stay on your, uh, uh, on your country. Don't engage. But if we don't engage, the, the problems and people will come to us. So I think we have to really learn this lesson. We have yet to do so. The United Nations has started with the two compacts, dealing with refugees and dealing with migration. But very unfortunately, we see that, for example, and first and foremost, the United States is, has decided or is going to decide not to be part of a global approach to tackle a global challenge. And this is really very unfortunate because it's also about uh, Western leadership in shaping and dealing with a global challenge. It's about our political, uh, moral uh, uh, leadership uh, which is challenged and we should give a strong example and a strong answer to that. Thank you. That's a, the U.S.'s decision to withdraw from the Migration Pact is a good transition to Senator Kane. Senator Kane? Yeah, no, I'll, I'm not going to talk about global leadership. I'm going to talk about my own team and I'm going to be very hard on my own team. The United States is not exercising the leadership that they should on this issue. We had a, a good session yesterday and I thought a, a wonderful point was made that language about um, NATO from the top is less important than the actions of the United States with respect to NATO, and those actions have been significant. Skirmishing about trade deals at the top, but then we have Ambassador Kraft going back and forth, and we've come up with an improvement of NAFTA, that's positive. The actions are more important than words, but sadly, the words and the actions of the United States are in exactly the same place on this issue and we're going the wrong direction. Let me give you greatest hits from the first 18 months, and I just wrote these down as quickly as I could. Muslim travel ban, describing um, migrants and refugees from Honduras where I, was a missionary, where I was a missionary coming to the United States as invaders, the same language that the individual used who went in and killed 11 people in a synagogue. That word, that phrase even used from the White House. Uh, deploying troops to the border to deal with them, which even Republican senators are calling a stunt. Our troops would never do anything that they're not supposed to do. They will serve honorably, but they have to go if they're sent. Being sent is being called a stunt. The notion, the president said this, that if those coming would throw rocks at the troops, the troops should return that with rifle fire. Family separation policies that take children away from their mothers and fathers at the border leaving desperate people. One individual from Honduras where I lived, when they tore his son out of his arms, he fought. They had to put him in a cell and he committed suicide because he didn't know whether he'd ever see his son again. The announcement of the administration to lower the refugee cap, to cut it by two-thirds of the number of refugees the United States would accept into the country. The president's own phrase quoted by many that we need to deal with immigration from shithole countries, reducing either the diversity visa program or the TPS program because people are coming from the wrong countries. A proposal to terminate DREAMers protection, the DACA program, which has only been enjoined by federal courts. Proposal to eliminate temporary protective status for half a million people legally in the United States who came following humanitarian disasters. A proposal to end birthright citizenship, which is in the Constitution of the United States. It was put in the Constitution to overturn the Dred Scott decision in 1857. And finally, the decision of the United States not to pull out of the global compact on migration. No, we made a decision a year ago that we didn't want to participate in the discussions about drafting a global compact on migration. Now that it's drafted, some other nations are following the United States lead to say that they will pull out Hungary and other nations. But we were the first nation that said we wouldn't even be at the table we wouldn't even be at the table to talk to other nations of the world about a non-binding, voluntary set of best practices for dealing with migrants and refugees. This is not a problem that will be solved as well if the United States is not at the table. I am confident enough and proud enough about American ingenuity to believe that any solution is going to be worse if we're not there at least offering ideas and sharing best practices. This is clearly a problem, 
and it affects us every day, and our non-involvement is making this worse. So we do not have the same commitment to the post-World War II values of people should not have to live under oppression without an alternative as we are demonstrating in our actions, for example, with support for NATO. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Arrow? <laughs> well, I think all three speakers have been very clear in sort of saying no, that we don't have a very clear commitment today. And I think my takeaway from just listening to the three of you is that we do have a crisis, not just a crisis of the, of the, the refugee framework, but a crisis in terms of conflict prevention and crisis management. But also, it's very clear that also there, much of the doctrines, much of the principles that have held us together in the last 50 years are beginning to fray at the seams. I wouldn't go as far as to say they're broken, but they are being tested, they are being challenged, more and more and so because I think the most stark reality from a European perspective is that for the first time I think we have seen from the African continent that Europe's own security problems have become externalized. That now Europe is expecting African countries um, outsourcing some of those problems to the African continent to fix it for it, as though somehow um, a number of countries themselves that are, in an, a number, are under an, a number of threat are able to solve Europe's problems for it. So what are you doing in response? Um, you're circumventing a number of important principles, a number of values that we've come to understand are European values, of democratization, human rights, um, freedom of movement, um, you're sacrificing that in, term, in, in return for getting African countries um, to act as transit routes, to act as transit bases, um, to prevent the movement of refugees, people who are caught in conflicts, um, to find safe havens for themselves. Um, the numbers of refugees in the world, 40 million, mm. two-thirds of those are not coming to Europe, are not coming to the United States. They're actually fleeing to neighboring countries. Those neighboring countries themselves are under stress. You know, they're actually fleeing to other unsafe places. They're actually even more vulnerable. They're actually facing um, further insecurity. So yes, the, the compact, even the one that is being revised by the UN today is under threat because the reality on the ground doesn't match much of the vision in that has been put on that, comp on that compact. Having said that, I, I want to go back to what um, Mrs. Kane said at the beginning. Um, there may be a lack of leadership in the places that we've come to expect them, but that is not the same on the ground. There are genuine workers on the ground in refugee camps, in humanitarian centers, um, NGO um, humanitarian services, who are working tremendously hard to safeguard a lot of those values on the ground. So if you look in at a lot of the refugee camps, whether it's in the Lake Chad Basin of region of West Africa, whether it's in the Horn of Africa region, South Sudan, in Somalia, in the DRC, you'll see tremendous work by, by various organizations, Western organizations, African organizations, regional organizations, that are trying to preserve, that are trying to hold true to those doctrines, that are trying to work very hard regardless of what is, is taking place at the international level. So the system at the top may be broken, but what we're seeing by the workers on the ground is very much about preserving the very essence of why they exist as a community as well. So you've got countless um, unsung heroes in the field, and you saw it in the video that we saw this morning of, 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 Le of Lesbos. So they, the, the, the compact, what is, whatever is going on in the, in the US, whatever is going on in Europe, is not reflected in the field where where a number of people are at the front line of a lot of these crises and are trying to preserve those very institutions that we've ascribed to for the last um, 50 years. I also think there's a great disconnect between what, we're, what is going on in Europe, what is going on in the US, and also what is going on um, in a number of countries in the, in the South as well. Because some of these countries that are at, um, themselves are war, so Uganda, for example, um, is has, has, has clearly kept hold of the Geneva Convention on, on Refugees, and is now a host to countless of refugees from South Sudan. Ethiopia, too, has just signed up to the, to the, to the UN Compact as well, and is, and is now dealing with the refugees, not only from Eritrea, but from South Sudan, and dealing with their own IDPs um, in its own countries as well. So the system may be half broken, 
Um, it may be an affirmative no, but I think what we're seeing on the ground is very, it's very different and we have to sort of sing in praise of those on the ground who are trying night and day to look after refugees, to look after IDPs, and to look after many who are trying to flee um, from, from areas of war as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Rotkin, um, Germany was a true leader during the refugee crisis, especially in, in 2015, um, and in particular Angela Merkel and, and your party. I'm wondering what lessons you feel were learned from that, what you would do differently today if that were to be done over? I'm glad that, for example, we have decided, we decided in 2015, when the refugees were in Europe, that we invite them to come to Germany and will not see a, a, a game sending refugees across the borders and no one is ready to take them and give protection to these refugees, which already were in Europe. I think this was a, a great humanitarian uh, uh, decision and out of political pragmatism mm. to decide it because the situation was there, not to, pl uh, to play a blame game, but to, to, to demonstrate courage and uh, to take a decision. What we then, I think, underestimated was the social psychological impact of migration in a high pace with high numbers uh, and from increasingly uh, distant cultural areas. Not so much related to Syria, but to, 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 to sub-Saharan African countries, there is a, a, a big cultural distance. Mm -hmm. So this requires a, 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 a huge effort for integration. And people have to, people, people have to come to terms with that. Uh, globalization uh, creates perhaps two parts. The, those who are, uh, are well-equipped, uh, well-educated, and uh, have and gain new opportunities, but others who feel uh, I'm not up to what is, what is, uh, uh, what is required uh, for me. I'm not on the winning side of, of, of this, uh, of, of the modern development. And all these changes and shifts, globalization, uh, uh, digitalization, and what all you have creates a huge fundamental uncertainty. And then you see these many, many people you don't know, who don't speak your language, coming and entering your country. This has caused uncertainty and it has caused angst. And I think we had better to prepare for that. We were unprepared. We are, we are uh, uh, to blame for being unprepared because we turned a blind eye on the situation which was already there before. But we didn't care for the refugees in the Jordan camps, in the, Lib in, in the camps in Lebanon, uh, and we, so we didn't pay attention. We didn't identify this problem as a European, as a global one, when the refugees landed in Italy. So this was then an Italian problem. But only when the refugees knocked on the, at the German doors and said, we want to be let in, and they came in. Then we saw the dimension of this problem, but we had missed to prepare our peoples to what is a new reality. So being unprepared for what was, was uh, clearly and had, had been for some time a new reality, putting Western societies under stress. This is, I think, what, if I could turn the clock back, we should have done better in a better way. But this is not an excuse, of course, for now. Uh, to, to address, but it, or it's, uh, on, the, on the contrary, it, 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 it is a, an additional imperative and reason now to prepare for what uh, was not a one-off problem and crisis. What we are seeing is that mass migration, uh, reiterating again, we have different types of migration, not only refugees, but also poverty migration uh, in bigger numbers that this will remain a pattern of our global community. And it will bring us together as, a West, as Western societies, because the Russians and others are going to exploit this element of insecurity and instability in Western societies for their political reasons in order to spoil uh, uh, Western societies. So we have to stick together. It's a test case 
for our moral leadership. It's a test case for our political leadership and survival. Uh, and we have to learn, we have to catch up, uh, and not to get intimidated by the right-wing populist nationalists who uh, want to teach us that we should not care for human beings in other countries. Thank you. And I, I wanted to ask the other panelists uh, a question that you answered with your, with your first response, which is what are the security implications of protecting refugees, of either bringing them in or keeping them out? Mrs. McCain? Well, it's a national security issue, whether you agree or disagree. It is a problem because it destabilizes the area, especially when you have, uh, as we have you so clearly put right now, is that uh, there's fear involved. There's fear involved on the part of the recipients that are that are hosting or going to host the, the refugees. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's a tragic scenario all the way around. They're fleeing for their lives. They're leaving either poverty, extreme poverty, strife, whatever it may be, um, and then and then you wind up in a in a situation that becomes even more destabilized than it was before. Um, it, it, I'll use a, an example of this. I was in the flow, the the Rwandan genocide. And so, so we, I came across the border from Rwanda into Zaire, then Zaire. Um, if, the, if Zaire had chosen to say no, I can't imagine what would have occurred there. It was already bad enough as it was with what was going on with the genocide. But if, if Zaire had said, nope, not happening, we're going to arm the borders, um, that would have been, I mean, a, a, not just destabilizing is a minor word. It would have been horrific. Uh, so I, I think the, the actual, in, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, 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 the fact that it is, I believe, a national security issue, I believe it's a world security issue, and it does need to be handled appropriately so that, so that they are received and they're loved and they're cared for and, and, and people are kind to them for that very reason. And I, don't, I also don't like the fear-mongering. It's not right. You know, we're all God's children, as I said this morning, and, and, and driving fear into people that are not living, in my case, living on the Arizona border and receiving them is not right. It simply isn't right. And, and, and we, well, we, the McCain decision talks very clearly about that. Thank you. Two, two points, one about the, the dimensions of the issue and then one on the national security. I'm going to tell a great John McCain story. <laughs> There's no um, of them. <laughs> from the Halifax Forum, actually. Um, on the dimensions of the issue, one of the, one of the areas in which maybe we are all unprepared and we could be forgiven for being unprepared is you might think of refugees and migrants as kind of an episodic challenge. You know, it's this, there's something bad happens and then there's a refugee flow and then we have to figure out how to deal with it. It's a permanent state of affairs. So thinking of it as a temporary episodic challenge when it really now is 60 plus million people. And it really goes back. I mean, I'm thinking of scripture, the Old Testament. My father was a wandering Aramean who went into Egypt and sojourned there and grew into a nation great and powerful. All through scripture, there's reference to the moving of populations and migrations. But we think about it, we will do different things if we think about it as a more permanent state. And with climate disasters and disease and war, and there's a whole series of things that will make this a permanent state. We have to think about it that way solutions for something that's more permanent than just episodic. Um, the McCain story. So when I came to the Halifax for the first time, Senator McCain is my chairman. I'm a new senator. He's drafting us to come. And the videos were very powerful that year. They were all about the atrocities in Syria, the barrel bombing by Bashar al-Assad. And, and Senator McCain was passionately advocating for a no-fly zone in northern Syria. Now, I heard that as a military thing that he was advocating. And I wasn't sure that a military solution was what we really needed. But, but by about February of 2014, I realized I was getting tripped over with the terminology. That what he, he basically was making the point, and in February I said, you've convinced me, I'm with you, was that we needed to provide a zone of protection, a humanitarian zone, enforce it by no fly, but it's a humanitarian zone so people can live in their own country. And we would do that for humanitarian reasons, but if we're not humanitarian, let's do it for our own reasons. Because the difference between millions of people having a place to live in their own country versus the effect of millions of people and the migration challenges throughout Europe. Think of what European politics is today because of those migrant outflows. Wind back the clock and, and ask uh, how some of the right-wing nationalist politics might look today if we had as a global community, uh, tried to intervene and 
create a humanitarian space where people could be safe from barrel bombs or ISIS or cholera or poverty. If we had done that and millions fewer had left, global politics in Europe and the United States would look a lot different today. And so there's national security issues. Can people squirrel themselves away in a caravan and come in and do bad things? Sure, that's why you have to have vetting and, and good procedures. But the sticking your head in the sand and thinking it won't affect you, that's, that's so naive. And, and the events of the last few years have demonstrated a, a horrific naivete, you know, and Senator McCain saw it faster than most of us. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about national security from the Africa um, continent perspective. So the DRC, for example, the 13.1 million people, um, people who need humanitarian assistance, the 4.5 displaced in the country. It's also the home for refugees from the Central African Republic, yeah. from, you got, um, from Burundi, also um, from South Sudan, and it's a country at war. That's a national security threat right there. You've got the South Sudan, 380 or so people have died. It's also the home for about 2.5 displaced. A lot of its refugees are going into Uganda. That's a national security threat right there. 900,000 people in, in, in Ethiopia, coming from Eritrea, coming from Sudan, coming from South Sudan. That's a national security threat right there. Somalia. It's been at war for countless decades now. And it's also the home for refugees. Picture that. That's a national security threat. If you don't respond to that refugee crisis, then you really do start another cycle for another kind of crisis. So it's, it, it is also early warning, it's conflict prevention, it's crisis prevention. You cannot expect the countries that are themselves that are ravaged by war to find a solution to the refugee crisis. So there, you're right, there is fear. And the, the numbers themselves are not a true reflection of what is happening on the ground. As I said, the, there is a, there's a picture that is painted that every refugee, every um, migrant is moving northwards. Whereas when you look carefully at the figures, there is a movement southwards, there's a movement to, to the north and south. So West African refugees that are coming out from the crisis in Mali, from Niger, um, coming out from the Lake Chad Basin, are not all going up towards Europe. Some of them are caught up in, in Niger, some of them are stuck in, in Chad, some of them battling smugglers and human um, traffickers um, in, the in the Sahara region as well. The same with Eritrea. In fact, a lot of them that are fleeing from Eritrea are not necessarily coming up to, um, to Europe. They're going into the Gulf regions. They're going into places like Yemen and into, into um, Djibouti as well. So I think we have to start um, broadening our narrative to also understand the South-South um, mm -hmm. threat of the refugee migrant crisis. Look at the reaction of South Africa. Um, on its borders because it, 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 a very sort of xenophobic reaction towards um, refugees and migrants coming from Zimbabwe, from Congo, and from Somalia as well. So you, you, once mm -hmm. you start sort of spinning this on its head and you start looking at it from the South-South perspective, you begin to realize that the picture is very, very, very different. Ven Venezuela, and how, and Venezuela, Venezuela and Colombia. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. these are countries that mm -hmm. do not have necessarily the, the right infrastructure, do not necessarily have um, credible security forces. Um, so the refugees themselves, we talked about protection, have no real safeguard or, or no real sort of safe haven to protect themselves from, from militias who abuse them, from sexual vi violations. The number of women and children that are caught up in this remains an un un untold story. So I think we need to start looking at national security in a very different um, way and understand what the national security means for countries themselves that, are, that have been asked to harbor this, that do not have the infrastructure in place, that do not have the necessary immediate means to look after a lot of refugees as well, and then themselves are, are vulnerable to, to, to a host of crises in their own countries or also in, the, in their neighborhoods as well. So that's, that's the other reality in the debate. That's the other lens of national security um, in, the, in the debate that, that, that Europe is having with, with itself, that the US is having with itself. It's a very different picture. Um, when you look at it ac across a number of countries that are, that are facing different kinds of stresses themselves. Just one more response to, to, um, to, 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 to Germany. It's, I mean, uh, unfortunately, Germany finds itself having to pay the price for a very um, sort of, for a policy that it wasn't even involved in, in or for a crisis that it wasn't involved in, i.e. Libya. 
you know, and they looked to 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 the the chancellor to to fix a problem that that Germany hadn't created, you know, and it's, so it's an unfortunate position, and, and a lot of people credited what um, Chancellor Merkel um, did as a as a right response, as a very pragmatic response, as safeguarding, protecting the values that that Europe had had aspired to. I think the the challenge today for Germany is how um, in trying to manage that right wing populist sort of wave that's going through Europe, how you preserve the integrity of the system, how you preserve the integrity of the European Union um, institution, but member states as well. And I think that's the real test for you because what we're seeing on the, on the continent is a, is a willingness to sacrifice much of what you built in the last 50 years. This is the union that won the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, that is about to sacrifice democratization, human rights, liberty and, and freedom for the name, in the sake of what? The sake of what? And I think that's the question a number of us are, are asking as citizens you know, who've, who've held to these values, that is Europe prepared to sacrifice all that on the, on the altar of, of what? And that's, that's the question I think today, not just for Germany, but I think for every member state of the, of the Union as well. Yeah. Do you have an answer? If, yeah, if, if you were ready to, to extend mm -hmm. your analysis mm -hmm. to the Western democracies, mm -hmm. I completely would agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there is also a mm -hmm. big democracy mm -hmm. uh, beyond yeah. the Atlantic. So mm -hmm. we, we really, we, we are facing a, a crisis mm -hmm. of Western democracies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we see as political phenomena mm -hmm. has, is very, very closely linked to the challenge of migration. Yeah. My thesis is that but without the topic of migration, we would not have seen Brexit. We would not have seen yes. Trump. Yeah. Yes. Trump has this played and capitalized mm -hmm. on the fears yes. stemming from migration. Yeah. And this is the same all over uh, the Western, most yes. of the Western countries. Yeah. It's quite significant where you do not have a, a migration problem or where this problem is managed in mm -hmm. some or other way. Mm -hmm. You do not have right wing a party, party. So this is true for Spain. This is true for was true. It's slightly changing, mm -hmm. uh, slightly but it because of the migration true. press. Yes. From, so this yeah. is, gives proof to my thesis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not. We do mm -hmm. not have a yeah. right wing populist party in Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, and until now not in Ireland. So, but in other countries uh, where this mm -hmm. problem has arrived or has been exploited by politicians in order to gain legitimacy and acceptance like Orban and others have done. So we have this big competition. What are we? What is the West? What is our normative yeah. political identity? And how unfortunate it is. It is necessary to fight again what we thought we had achieved forever in a way, yeah. that we are the liberal West with clear no, with, with, which is constituted by core values, and unfortunately, this is on the line again, and yeah. we have to take on the fight about this. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Let's open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah. Hi, Basimo Mani, professor at the University of Waterloo. Thank you for that. That was really very, very enlightening. Um, I just wanted to mention that Canada also took in 50,000 Syrian refugees, and it really is a role model of how to do it right. And being here, I think it's really important to commend mm -hmm. many people in this room who were part of that process. And you know, and it can be done right. I just want to point out, not too far away from here, in Nova Scotia, there's a Syrian family that created a cho took their chocolatier company that was destroyed in Aleppo and came here and created a company called Peace by Chocolate. Now it's become one of the most successful chocolatiers in this country, just a few hours away, so please do visit them. Mm. Um, <laughs> one of the things, uh, Mr. Kane, that you pointed out that I think is really important is this idea that, you know, from the very beginning, if we looked at this as a potential security, prob security problem globally, we wouldn't be in a situation where we might yeah. completely agree with. But we have a principle for that, and it's called responsibility to protect. Another great Canadian initiative, mm. which we should have really thought about in all of these situations. It's not about state failure, it's about governments abusing their own people. Mm. You know, whether we're talking about Syria, Venezuela, Eritrea, South Sudan, I mean, you name it, it these flows are also generating from, frankly, an absence of good governance 
in these countries. And we need to start thinking about ways, and uh, frankly, only when it comes to our doorstep do we start to say, oh, this is a security problem. But res responsibility to protect from its essence was the idea that this is going to be a security problem in the long term. And so let's address it in their own country. So I'd love to just, I, I don't know who on the panel to talk about this, but how can we start thinking about, again, the long game? Because you know, we've been too short term, and, and your comments about that south to south is really emblematic of that. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, we, need, we need better ideas globally about how we address the refugee crisis from the standpoint of being predictive rather than reactionary. Well, just one thought. So you're right. We have to look at the problem the right way if we're going to solve it the right way. I, I think the U.S., you look at this period in U.S. history, we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq, we're heavily engaged in military activity in the region now for 17 years. The American public is challenged by it. Have we, have we accomplished what we wanted to? Do people even appreciate that we've done it? So there's a little bit of a fatigue that would have been somewhat the same as the dynamic between World War I and World War II. When issues come up that are humanitarian crises, in Libya, the, the question kind of gets politically framed, does Gaddafi have to go? Or in Syria, does Bashar al-Assad have to go? And if you start talking about it that way, oh, should we change the regime out or not? Should, does Mubarak have to go? You, you're, you're talking about kind of one problem where the issue is, what can we do to protect people is a very different lens. And so, you know, I just, I'm fairly close to President Obama, and I, I think around Syria, I could almost see the wheels turning in his head. I'm not, I'm not quoting him, but, but when he heard himself say, Assad must go, I think he reminded himself, hmm, we said Saddam Hussein must go, we said Mubarak must go, we said Gaddafi must go, and it's not like when they went, everything was suddenly fine. So he said Assad must go, but then I think he kind of caught himself short and said, hold on a second, we're probably looking at this the wrong way. But when you look at it and like, do we like the regime or not? Should the regime change or not? You're not looking at it through the, the responsibility to protect lens. And maybe that can be a lesson that's come out of this that we need to redirect back toward the protect. When John was talking about no-fly zone, I was hearing military, military, military. We have had enough of the military. But, yeah. but what he was saying is that was just to protect the humanitarian, the, the responsibility to protect. And, and when I finally realized why he was proposing, and I, he, he was really in the responsibility to protect mode, we have to kind of get our lens back, focus that direction when these crises come up. I, I, I mean, so just to go back to, to the question and your, and your answer. So you said it's, you know, it's talking about more the long, playing the long game. I think what's, what's missing is the politics um, and investing in, in peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a tendency to look for very short term military responses to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, very complicated, multi layered crisis. I'll give you a, a very good example. Today we have a stalled peace process in Mali, but the focus of Europe particularly, um, through the creation of the G5 Sahel Force, is around curbing the movement of people, i.e. migration, and dealing with counter-terrorism. But it doesn't deal with the heart of the matter. And if you don't deal with the politics of why Mali is in crisis, of why Niger is vulnerable, of why Burkina Faso is one, door, one doorstep away from an insurgency, and why we, why, you know, we still have you know, Boko Haram in the Northeast, then you're not going to solve the problem. You're not, mm. going to, you're not going to end the crisis. So we continue to stumble from one crisis to another crisis, and we keep sort of sidestepping the real issue. Where, where, is the, where is the peace settlement? Where is the political settlement? And where is the investment to safeguard the peace, to guarantee protection, mm -hmm. to guarantee that you're dealing with the socioeconomic causes, root causes of the, of, the, of the conflict, to guarantee that a country remains stable. For so long as we don't deal you know, more intimately, more seriously with these issues, you're going to carry on having a refugee crisis. You're going to carry on having IDPs. You're going to carry on having people fleeing from, from, their, from their borders. And more worryingly, you're going to see conflicts bleeding into one another. So a crisis that starts in Mali today doesn't stop at the doorstep of Mali, ends up rippling across several borders. Look at the um, Boko Haram crisis in Nigeria. It's no longer Nigeria's problem. It's a problem of Niger, it's a problem of, of Cameroon. Cameroon, it's a problem of Chad. 
And the response, what is the response? The short-term response. It's a very heavy-handed military response. Meanwhile, you know, we've gone from technically defeated to uh, a group that is still a, a threat, a group that has become very clever and smarter, more agile. It's responding to the military pressure. It's going rural. It's, it's finding different ways. And it's, and it's now working within rural communities, uh, working along you know, with, with vulnerable groups. And we continue that circle of violence as well. So you're absolutely right that, that we have to think about you know, responsibly to protect in a very different way, not, not within this very short term um, perspective, but a more comprehensive one that deals with the root causes of, of, the, of, the, of the crisis that we're talking about. I just want to add one aspect. Because mm -hmm. I totally agree on the comprehensive approach we have mm -hmm. to find in the long term game we have to mm -hmm. play, of course. But from a pragmatic political view, I want to add, we have to start with, uh, to, uh, with a policy to re gain control mm -hmm. over what is happening. Sure. So the experience of loss and lack of control. So people said, mm -hmm. you don't have sovereignty, we don't have sovereignty and control over our borders. This is the very, one of the very essentials for why we do have a state. So to regain this impression that we have control uh, and over the situation is absolutely important to get again into a position that we earn some credibility to, to play the, the, the comprehensive and long-term game. But, but Europe's response, and I say it again, Europe's response to regain that control was to outsource its problems to the continent, for example. So it said, let's deal with the, let's deal, let's deal with the asylum and the migration people in Niger. Let's provide Niger you know, with money. But, but this to is deal not with. going to run. So no, I agree with you. Yeah. But that, is, that was the initial first step. And it's a wrong yeah, it, But it's not an outsourcing. It's, yeah. you could, I, I, so it's not going to run. But yeah. it's not outsourcing would be uh, uh, if, if, we would, uh, if, if, we, if we transferred European problems to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problems are stemming from Africa. And they're stemming from coming from the Middle, uh, from the middle East. So uh, I think, however, so, but, but we, will not, we will not apply our European or national procedures uh, in Africa or in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. So we have to be realistic and uh, over-promising is, uh, is a program for disappointment and for political failure. Mm -hmm. However, to, to give proof that we have regained control is a necessary step uh, which, in, which will enable us to then pursue a policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have two questions over there. We ask them both at the same time. And uh, Hello, Lincoln Bloomfield from the Stimson Center in Washington. Thank you for a very good discussion. Um, I realize that each failed state scenario where people flee is different, but there are some that, that have certain similarities. It has struck me since 2011 when the Syrians fled uh, the war that the presumption was that they have to be assimilated somehow, somewhere, and that somehow Bashar al-Assad still has all of the perquisites of sovereignty, that he can t lecture us on who stays and who goes, even though there are UN resolutions that lead to the transition to a different power. My question is, I'm sure there are many people in the room who have been following the travails of Lebanon through the decades where we had Palestinian mm -hmm. camps. Well, what happened? And do we really need to see a movie where children never get their education and they wake up one day with a cell phone and a, and a Kalashnikov looking for someone to blame? This is a movie that doesn't necessarily need to repeat itself. So I've always mm -hmm. wondered, do we assimilate all of the Syrians or do we find ways to educate their children toward a future Syria that's more demographic, pluralistic, uh, legitimate? And at the same time, do we start talking about the erosion of legitimate rights of a government which has committed some of the most horrific crimes against humanity that we've ever seen? And perhaps when we do donor conferences in Kuwait and, and try to pull the tin cup together, shouldn't we be recognizing that 90% of those people will only go back when the Assad regime is gone and the Syrian armed forces aren't attacking them and bombing their towns? And so the question is, can we envision, to go to your point, sir, um, a thought process that leads to sometimes refugees going home again. I'm not an expert on Venezuela, but you would think that with the wealth of Venezuela someday, those Venezuelans would want to go home again. So can we begin to plan uh, with some of these populations for their return? And in that sense, uh, Senator Kane, I think that you know, a no-fly zone would have been great eight, seven years ago, 
But I think perhaps a transition in Syria might still be the ticket to rebuilding Syria, sending many Syrians home again, and alleviating the world from a bigger problem. And Dixon, do you want to ask your question? Then we'll. Sure, thank answers. you. Dixon Osborne with the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco. And our mission is to hold accountable in a court of law perpetrators of mass atrocities. I would rather be out of business. I'd rather make sure that the mass atrocities that we see occurring, whether it's Syria, happening with the Rohingya, uh, and so on, end. We keep uh, trying to address the problem as the problem is occurring, as opposed to even before that. And I'd welcome your thoughts on this. If our values are reflected in our national budgets, for the United States, our values is the military response. We do not invest in, in any great measure in development and in diplomacy. Uh, and as was alluded to earlier, General Mattis said, if you don't invest in, in development and uh, democracy, you're going to have to buy me more bullets. And that's what we keep doing. We keep making that mistake. I would like your thoughts on how do we build a consensus about the United States, but globally on how to build out democracy, rule of law, provide the, the development that is needed globally so that perhaps we can prevent or mitigate these atrocities in the first place. I have a thought, but did somebody want to go before? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, very, I'm, I'm going to deal with that question because it's so important. And, and there are examples. Mm -hmm. Colombia. Mm -hmm. the, the U.S. through three administrations, and this is an example about root causes, through three administrations, the end of the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. and then the Bush administration, and then the Obama administration, was making security investments mm -hmm. and economic investments in what was you know, viewed as a failed state or a state on the verge of collapse. And now Colombia has come such a long way, there's, there's much more to do, but the investment we've made in Colombia is jeopardized by what's happening in Venezuela. If we're not proactive about Venezuela, then the refugee flows into Colombia could destabilize mm -hmm. an example of, here's an example of US foreign policy that really worked, where we looked at root causes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the caravans from the Northern Triangle, you cannot look at that as a situation. You mentioned that Germany had to deal with a Libya and it wasn't Germany's fault. Their pain is connected to our pain. Mm -hmm. The violence in Central America in the neighborhoods where I used to work and where I still have friends is very much driven by our consumption of drugs. Mm -hmm. So if we Americans and Canadians, Northerners, consume a lot of drugs and we send a whole lot of cash south and the cash is transiting through these really poor countries, then gangs will try to fight to get a hold of that money and the neighborhoods become so violent. And then people leave and then they come here and we're sort of like, why'd you show up here? Well, look, their pain is connected to our pain. It's, it's not disconnected. So President Obama in the last few years of his administration with two Republican houses said, give me a billion dollars a year to invest in the Northern Triangle for security assistance and for economic development assistance. And with two Republican houses, we got $750 million a year, essentially. This administration is slashing those monies by 30 or 40%. Mm. Now, if you slash the monies about security assistance, if you slash the monies about economic development, you can't be surprised when people flee violent neighborhoods and then they, they come to a place where they think they'll be safer. So, there are, but, but the good news is we do have some examples of us doing it right and it working. So we just ought to repeat the strategies that work and not, not mm -hmm. cut them. And we're going to end up spending so much more money at the border that, than if we hadn't slashed the development monies into Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. The mess and disaster we see in the Middle East is absolutely closely linked to decades and a series of major political mistakes, both by the Europeans and by the United States. Uh, the Europeans are to blame for not for non engaging in, the, in this region. The, the recent question if there were another uh, humanitarian catastrophe in the Syrian Idlib region mm. is it completely in the hands uh, of, mis, of, 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 of leaders like Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Putin without any European or n close to zero influence of the United States. So the United States are now on the, on the fringes of political influence in the Middle East. The 2003 invasion of Iraq, a major mistake by historical measures. 
uh, and this uh, the, this exaggeration of of of, uh, uh, of of intervention was followed by an overcorrection uh, under the Obama administration, and now we have a complete disaster. Uh, the Iran policy, uh, trying to isolate Iran uh, and rally the the Sunni uh, countries against Iran, will not contribute in any way to the stability of this region, mm -hmm. and the Europeans have not lived up to the fact that this is our, our neighborhood. It's not in the neighborhood of the United States. It's our neighborhood. The Mediterranean is our, is our neighborhood sea. So this is also due to our mistakes and our absence of action. So and now it's, of course, you're right. If we had, if we had a solution, a political settlement, settlement in Syria, mm -hmm. this would contribute, of course, to the relocation, resettlement of Syrians. Because most of them, they love their country. Most of people do not want to leave their country. They want to stay there where they are born, where the language is spoken, they, they speak. But we are far away from a political settlement there uh, than we have been because we have made the way free for Russian influence, for Iranian influence, and all the, the, the countries like that. So we are less influential there than, in other, uh, than we have been before. And then secondly, we have to differentiate. We have, we have really the two big sources. It's conflict, war, uh, we have in the Middle East, and the other one is poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one uh, produces the bigger numbers even. And also there we need to have preventive engagement, otherwise we will be overrun by sheer numbers. Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I yeah. only wish the conversation that we were having here was also happening in the capitals of our countries, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. Thank oh. you. Thank not in ours, anyway. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.